All right. Well, let's get this show on the road. Uh, thank you all for coming tonight. I really appreciate it. Uh, also, appreciate you wearing your masks uh, if you have them. I think uh, it's probably easier to understand Pete or me if we don't have our masks up here, but we'll try to, as we walk through, we'll, we'll, we'll wear our masks. Um, I just think this is such a terrific thing. Dr. Enns is from Philadelphia, or, or close by Philadelphia, and so he, he came across the country this morning, and, and uh, I went and picked him up at uh, the beautiful Salt Lake Airport, which he was very impressed by. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Could have been designed better, but that's okay. Yeah, Other than that. Walk. I was exhausted by the time I got, you know. <laughs> I know, I did, yeah. yeah. I, I told him to stay hydrated, so yeah. Yeah, I thought it was a good idea. I anyway. Uh, Dr. Enns is, I'm just going to read it off, his, off one of his books here is because I would get it wrong. Abraham S. Clemens, professor of biblical studies at Eastern University in Philadelphia. He has also taught at a number of different uh, universities and seminaries and spent some time uh, uh, in, in a number of different places uh, working for uh, other kinds of places, but he'll, he'll tell you that. This year he is on right, sabbatical, well. so that's why I, I, maybe that's why we got him to come out. Uh, anyway, he's he's working during during his sabbatical. He's written uh, or co-authored approximately 20 books. He told me, and we we just have uh, a few of them back there. They're all $15. He'll sign them if you would like it afterwards, um, and he'll put nice things. Won't you put nice things in there? Yeah. Okay. How do you spell imbecile? With an I, <laughs> E, I'll figure it out. That's, yeah. Good. Anyway, I am, I'm thrilled to have him here. He, he, I think you're just going to love it, and uh, we'll, we'll learn some things tonight. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Pete Evan. Ends. Ends. Close God. enough. Yeah. <laughs> so this is on. Can you hear me? With the, okay, perfect. Wonderful. So... Um, yeah, I was thinking the other day, this is the first time I've gone a place to speak since COVID. Yeah. I mean, I did a couple, a few things on Zoom, which is, you know, it's Zoom, right? It's not the same thing. But, uh, and the last time, it was in February of 2020, I went to three places in three, like three weeks in a row in like different time zones. So I was like, I was in Texas, I think, North Carolina, and Kansas City, Missouri, and I was exhausted. And after that, I said, oh, Lord, I just need a break. <laughs> so I, I take responsibility for COVID. I, it's, it's my fault. It's not the Chinese. It's not Trump. It's me. I did it. So, all right. Um, yeah, so anyway, and yeah, this is, uh, I, I got a haircut for you people on Wednesday. That's how, like, excited I was about, like, I'm going to see people again, you know. And, uh, but I was teaching last year during COVID with, you know, students, and, and that was, like, the hardest year teaching in my life because they're all scared to death, first of all, like, they're going to die. And the hardest thing, I mean, don't you feel bad about this, but with their masks on, I can't tell how they're reacting to anything that I say. Because, you know, we sometimes we're pushing issues a little bit in, in ways they might not be comfortable with. And not to ruin their lives, but actually to prepare them for adulthood. That's really what we're doing. And I, my, my phrase with these kids is, um, you know, when we talk about something that might be things they haven't heard in a youth group that they went to or something, I say, listen, welcome to adult Bible reading. This, this is a complex book. It's many layered, and uh, it's worthy of your adult attention. It's not a storybook for kids, right? Um, but, you know, that's what you can't gauge reactions. I'm not really concerned here with adults, but with, with young people, it was sort of hard. So anyway, and this is my second trip to Utah ever. I, w I spoke with a couple of other biblical scholars at Brigham Young University. The laughter. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, here, how'd that go? Let me tell you how that went, okay? No coffee on campus. That's how it went. <laughs> All right? And I should have known that. I mean, just like people just generally, I didn't know that. So I'm like, where's the coffee? They're like, we don't do that. So, All right. Um, but uh, it was myself as a Protestant, uh, 
Another guy, James Kugel, who's a name maybe some of you know, he was my professor at Harvard and uh, Jewish, and then also um, a Roman Catholic scholar. We got together to give our perspectives on what we think the Bible is and how the Bible works, engaging with about 15 of the faculty, half of whom were biblical scholars there. And I'm telling you, the biblical scholars at BYU, they're out there. I, I mean, they're very progressive. At least, I mean, don't get them in trouble for me saying that, but it was a very small group. But, um, you know, I, I mean, they were all over things like, you know, this may mean nothing to you, I, I don't know, but, you know, Moses didn't write the Pentateuch. There are sources that make up the... That's, that's their frame of reference, you know. They're, they're not evangelical, they're not fundamentalist. I was really... I was... Um, surprised, you know, because I came in there with a judgment about what they might be like, and, and I found that to be totally untrue. So, um, you know, that doesn't mean they don't have maybe, I, I could sense that they had um, I's to dot and T's to cross. And I think this was a time for them to let their hair down a little bit with a very, it wasn't a public meeting, it was a meeting of academics. And I think that they felt more like they could sort of speak freely, which I understand too, because I was in a um, very conservative environment for years. Not actually a horribly conservative environment, but still pretty conservative. Um, Westminster Theological Seminary, which is a Calvinist seminary outside of Philadelphia. And um, I know what it's like to have these ideas you're excited about and not feel the freedom to talk about them. And I sort of sense that from these people as well, these scholars, they probably had political issues they had to negotiate. Imagine that, politics and faith. That those two things, they should never go together. Oh, who, who, who knew? Um, so anyway, yeah, I, you know, today, and I guess whoever wants to, <laughs> a lot of people don't come back for the second day, I won't blame you, but for today and tomorrow, right, um, I just think we could just talk about the Bible and stuff. Why not, right? Um, because, um, see, here's the thing about the Bible, all right? It's a very old book. It's not even a book. It's a collection of books, right? Um, the earliest biblical writings, depending on who you ask, but there are parts of the Bible that a lot of scholars are pretty sure date to about the year 1200 B.C. or B.C.E., if you will, right? What's happening then? That's the time... It's before David. David is around the year 1,000. You're going to get a timeline here, folks. I'm sorry. I deal with timelines. That's how I keep things in my head, right, and not just scattered information. But um, so, you know, from about 1,200 to about 200 B.C., that 1,000-year span of time roughly is when the writings that became the Hebrew Scriptures were written. And... Then you have the New Testament following along, and the earliest New Testament writings, probably some of Paul's letters, we don't know exactly. It's, it's hard to know this stuff, we just take guesses, frankly. But maybe written in like the 40s, around the year 50, and the latest New Testament writings, maybe 50 years later, you know, around 100, maybe 110 or something like that. But it doesn't matter, we're dealing with an old collection of books written over different times, different places, different circumstances by different people, a very diverse collection of writings that are put into this cover. And so it's ancient, you know, and <clears throat> how ancient is it? Um, David lived, just to pick a big name from the Old Testament, David lived about 3,000 years ago, right? But think about this, we're as far removed from the time of David backwards as we are removed from the year 5,000 forwards. That's, that's, that, that gives me a sense of time. It gives me a scale. We're dealing with a, a collection of writings that come from a time and a place and cultures and even languages that we fr frankly don't have any like intuitive sense about. It's very, very foreign, right? So that's the Bible we have. And here we are today, <laughs> right? And the question comes up, what does that have to do with us? 
And my answer is, that's a really good question. <laughs> you know, because it's not always easy to ferret out what that is. The only thing that I will say is that, and, and you can, by the way, anything that I say, you can feel free to disagree on. You know, I, I, it doesn't bother me. If we can talk about these things, I don't know everything. Um, but, you know, the, 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 this time span of the Bible, you know, it, it's, it's such a, um, it's like an impediment almost at times because it's so foreign and so strange. But if you're going to walk the Christian path in any sense of the word, this is my opinion, I would say the same thing about the Jewish path in any sense of the word. That scriptural tradition is something that's going to be a part of the conversation at some point, right? It's hard to say I am I'm, I'm Christian. However you want to define it, that's another thing. But I'm, I'm Christian. I'm very progressive, but I'm Christian. But I don't think the Bible has any relevance for Christian faith. That's a ver I think that's a difficult case to make personally. You may hate half of it, but you still got to struggle with it and deal with it, right? And so a lot of, you know, my thinking really started in seminary and then in graduate school where I really wanted to, I guess, bring those worlds together for my own sake. You know, I mean, I don't tell people this very often, but those books out there and any other book I've written, that's just me journaling. <laughs> that's me trying to put the pieces together and just lay it out there and see what people think about things, right? But it's trying to take an ancient faith and a context, ours, that the ancient writers could not remotely have imagined, right? And we say, how is this scripture for us? How is this the word of God for us? All those kinds of things. And I think, you know, for me, again, this is just how I process it. Um, Coming to a final answer on that question is not as important to me as leaving that question as something that I keep processing and thinking about, right? I think, um, what's that Miley Cyrus song? It's the climb. You guys know that song? Good. You, I'm glad you don't know it, but she was like 14. She's singing about something philosophical she has no right to think about. But anyway, um, the, the point is... Um, the, the journey is the faith. It's, it's not, I'm, I'm, I'm very convinced of that. You know, words like mystery and journey have become very central to my life because, frankly, I don't know what I'm talking about, right? We're talking about God here, for heaven's sake. And, and even what you mean by God can be unpacked for days and weeks and months and years, right? So we're all trying to... Um, in one way or another, in one sense or another, bring this tradition and our own existence into some sort of conversation. And um, that's not always easy because the Bible is a challenging book to do that with, right? Because <clears throat> you come up against things. I mean, you know, for example, um, I'm sort of Episcopalian, I'm not sure. I don't like being locked into anything. I always want an escape route if I'm not happy with it, but I've been going to an Episcopal church more or less for about 11, 12 years. And um, there's one of the, one of the uh, parishes, they asked me to come speak because they had been going through um, a, a read through the Bible, listen to this, read through the Bible in 90 days. Yeah, that's crazy, right? The only people who do that are evangelicals and fundamentalists. Nobody else would ever think to do that. But they, they're doing it. And within a few days, the rector emailed me and said, could you come speak to us? I said, well, why, what's going on? And she said, people are dying all over the place in this book. And, you know, people haven't read this Bible. I mean, with, with the Episcopalian, you know, the Episcopal Church, it's, uh, it's liturgy, there are readings, and most of the bad stuff is cut out which is not a bad idea, by the way. I think that's probably a good idea. Um, but so, you know, the thing is, uh, it's, it's a book where 
you get to chapter 6 of the Bible and everybody dies. Right? The flood story. I mean, it, and that's a hard thing to process, you know, and it's, it's a reminder to, to me that the Bible was not written with me in mind or any of us in mind. It was written, it, it's, it's, a, it's a piece of, it's like a theological declaration, the Bible, for the people who put it together and for whom it was put together. What is God like? And the language that is used to talk about God is the language of the idioms of the day. Right? <clears throat> and before I go on, I want to say, make something really clear here. I'm not kidding. I, I love the Bible. I love reading it. I love not knowing what's going on in places. I love trying to figure it out. I love teaching students how to process this book like adults. And, you know, growing up more or less with the Bible myself and having read all of it a lot of times, there are parts of it that mean a lot to me, right? I mean, not everything. I can do without the Song of Songs. I can do without 2 Corinthians, frankly, because Paul's really angry there the whole time. But that's, see, that's me. That's not for other people, right? Um, I love the book of Ecclesiastes because he's so depressed. And you can connect with somebody like that where nothing makes sense, right? That stuff's in the Bible. I love it. Um, so I, I really do love the Bible, but I also struggle with the Bible. And one thing that we could, you know, talk about over the next day or two is that, I mean, this is, this is the Bible itself. There, there are parts of the Bible that struggle with other parts of the Bible, right? And people have been struggling with the Bible since forever. And, and not to be too simplistic here, I don't want to do that, but, um, you know, Judaism has ha tended to have a much better handle on the idea of struggling with God and struggling with the text. And how struggling with God and struggling with the Bible is actually what faith, it, it, it grounds faith, it, it, it makes it real. And studying the Bible and debating the Bible vigorously and coming to different conclusions that are irreconcilable, that's actually an act of worship because you're acknowledging the mystery and the otherness of God. And I don't think Christians have tended to have a good handle on that side of things. Not, I mean, I think for much of Christian history, Christians actually got that, they understood it. I think it's really just the last few hundred years with the Protestant Reformation, for example, where um, you t tended to lock things into one meaning, like it, it just means one thing. And, um, and now one of my Jewish professors at Harvard, John Levinson, who's a wonderful person and a great writer, a great thinker, but he says the difference between Christians and Jews when it comes to the Bible is that for Jews, the Bible is a problem that you get to try to solve. And you may not solve it, but you get to try to. For Christians, the Bible is a message to be proclaimed. And if you have it as a message that has to be proclaimed, guess what? It's all about ironing out the one true meaning. Right? Which I think is a shame. Because the Bible... <laughs> I mean, I really don't want to get into this too deeply, at least today, but uh, the problem with that notion is that the Bible itself doesn't allow you to whittle it down to one meaning because the Bible itself is very diverse, right? I'd like to really try to get to that this evening. Um, but I mentioned one thing, but before we get to that, I mentioned one thing before about the violence of the Bible, and that's usually the first thing that my students also want us to talk about. Like, they, they're told as evangelicals, read your Bible every day, and so they do. And that's when the questions start, because they're all over the place. You know, why are people dying? Why is everybody dying in chapter 6 with the flood story? Why, why is God's go-to 
disposition, it seems to be some sort of physical violence, either death or plague or exile. Why, why is this God's way of handling with things? And I am wondering um, about you. You know, I'm, I imagine many of you have processed things as well, but what, I'd actually like to hear from you, what are some things that make the Bible like, ugh, I have to read this thing again. I really don't feel like it. Again, oh no, here we go. Like, like what, what are some of those things? Hmm? The Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel. Right, right. Yeah, it, it's... Very you, it, I can tell. <laughs> Do you have a therapist you can talk to about this? No? But I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, I mean, to me, there are two aggravating things there from, from my hearing you. Is One is the portrayal of God, which is really a big issue in the Bible in general. How is God being portrayed, right? That's the thing that people... I think, it, frankly, I think it all comes down to that. It's not like, boy, those Israelites are idiots killing each other. It's God's role in that. That's the problem. But the other is, let's call it a scientific anthropological thing about where languages come from. <laughs> right? And the thing is that that chapter, that story contradicts the previous chapter when they're all let out in the flood and people are scattered all over the world. And all of a sudden, in the next chapter, they're in one place. So how do you reconcile those things? I don't think you do. I think there are two angles on something, right? Just like Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, right? The two creation stories are different. They're irreconcilable creation stories. But they're next to each other, and there's probably a reason for it. My, my guess is that Genesis 1 and 2 gives us the two views of God you see throughout the entire Bible. The God of transcendence, Genesis 1 button pusher, everything is the way God says, and it lines up. Genesis 2, not the transcendent God, but the imminent God who walks in the garden with Adam and Eve. The God who's very far away, the God who's very close by. I, I, I think there's a reason for it. There's probably a reason for that as well in the mind of the editor. But it's not an explanation historically of where languages come from or why people are spread all over the earth. Again, we're seeing things through an ancient lens, and that's that's one of the things, one of the struggling points with the Bible is that we are seeing things the way ancient people understood them to be. Living in a tribal context where God is a warrior and God hates your enemies as much as you do. Go kill them. <laughs> hey kids, let's read the Bible together. Right? So, yes, yeah. I think one thing that's interesting about that comment is it illustrates the legitimate ambiguities of all of these stories that are actually open to different interpretations. And if you want proof of that, my proof of that is the entire history of Judaism and Christianity, right? Taking these stories differently and seeing different things in them, right? Which is why it's sort of nice to not always insist that you're right all the time, right? And I know that's, that's hard to say, but... Because I am basically am right most of the time. You know, that's why it's hard for me to... Uh, anyway, yes. <laughs> Yes, yeah. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, the thing, what's been wonderful, I appreciate that comment because it rings true to me and I think maybe to other people here too. Going outside of your own tribe and hearing them talk about things, it's like, it, it's almost a wake-up call. Even, <clears throat> even if God is not acting like a two-year-old, I don't think God is acting like a two-year-old. I think God is acting like... Um, A, a really uptight king, which is a little different, you know, I think, because I think the models of God in antiquity are really rooted in issues of, like, royalty, you know, not really feudalism, that's a much later thing, but that comes in the medieval period, but I think, you know, you, you don't hack off the superior power, because there's always going to be punishment in that, right? So, but, um, yeah, so the, the portrayal of God, yes. Um, I should go so far as like knowing context. There's so much history outside the Bible that I don't know. And like knowing where to even start. Yeah. You know? Like it's, it's, all, it's all interconnected and yet all Right. Well, there were books out there for $15. No, um, <laughs> now, you know, the, what I would suggest, seriously, is the best thing to do is to own one or two good study Bibles. Because some of them are just amazing. I can tell you what they are, the ones that I like the most. Um, the Harper Collins Study Bible is very good. These are all um, new revised version translations except for one of them, right? Um, the New Interpreter's Study Bible. And uh, don't buy all these, just if, if you're really interested, just go on Amazon and look around to see if you like them or not. Um, the other is the Jewish Publication Society Study Bible, which is just the Old Testament, because, you know, you're laughing. Like, uh, like you're idiots, you don't know that, right? Okay. <laughs> now, that's just the Old Testament, because it's Jewish, right? <laughs> but for all you people laughing at me right now, there's also the Jewish, uh, the... Um, a Jewish annotated New Testament, so <laughs> gotcha, um, <laughs> written by uh, Jewish scholars who are commenting the footnotes are from a Jewish perspective on the New Testament, which is very interesting, right? Now, the thing is that it's, and you know, there's no, there's no way around it. You have to do the work. There's no website that's going to give this to you. you just, and if there's a book of the Bible that you're interested in, pick a short one, it doesn't matter, just, and read the notes beneath it. And some of these study Bibles, what, what makes them worth the price is the back, they have essays. And I'm telling you, it's like a seminary education for like $40. It's, it's really, really helpful. And, and of course, maps. And you know, if you're reading you know, again, bringing it down to the level of my students, like you're reading about the Exodus story, I'm like, go in the back of the Bible and just see where Egypt is, for heaven's sake. You know, where's the Nile Delta? Just know where you are and where Israel is in relation to that. And then where's, where's Syria? Where's Assyria? Where's Babylon? Where's Moab? Where's, all these places. Just have a sense of where these things are because it helps us understand the theology of the texts. It really does. Knowing historical circumstances helps. Knowing, well, some, we don't know, we can't always say we know these things, but having a good idea of when something might have been written will help us understand why it was written, and therefore will help us understand the theology of what's written, right? Because that, to me, that's where it all goes down to. All the other stuff 
helps us understand what were these writers saying about God and why were they saying it. So the flood story, they were saying something about God, or the Tower of Babel story, they were saying something about God that made sense in their context. And my goal is to try to understand as best as I can what they were trying to say about God. And then I ask myself, what do I do with that? Right? And that's a different, that's a different order of question at that point. Right? Uh, other hands? Yes. One, one, two, and then three. So, go ahead. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I said the book I really don't enjoy reading is Leviticus. Every time I read it, I, you know, I just, I don't. But I think what I struggle with the most is the justification of the carnage in the Bible. The justification so, of the carnage. Yeah. The justification for it. The way it's right. twisted and, well, you know, it's to do this or to do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I struggle with that. Because yeah. To me, it's carnage, it's wrong, and um, mm-hmm. I can't. Right. So that's where I, that's where I uh, start. Yeah, we're back to the violence, right? right. Yeah, and, it's, and it's, 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 um, it's either God inflicted or God gives permission or God orders to do it, right? And people talk yeah. about the Koran, but I've only read two different uh, Korans because there's as many different. But, you know, they talk about the violence in that, but they have not read our Bible. <laughs> That's what, what's his face? Richard Dawkins, you know, the, the famous atheist, he, he uh, after 9-11, and all the Christians, see, Islam, this is where I get to, he's like, have you ever read the Old Testament? You know, because it's, it's comparable, you know, ruthless view towards enemies, but not everywhere. See, that's, that's the interesting thing. There are places, maybe we can talk about one or two of those later, but there are places in the Bible that seem to paint a different picture of God. Okay, I want to listen to that too, and I want to listen to the dialogue between those parts of Scripture and ask myself, okay, what do I learn from that, right? See, that, again, that's the Jewish mentality, if I can say, of like, there's the debate happening within the pages of the Bible itself on some of these things, right? And... I mean, once you start digging at the different points of view that writers have, how Leviticus is a point of view on some things, but Deuteronomy differs from Leviticus in places. And I don't know, for some reason Deuteronomy is more interesting to me, but that might just be... I it's also way more violent. Maybe you're just a violent person. <laughs> well, maybe it's more interesting because I struggle with it more. Yeah. Things are interesting that you struggle with. Yeah. That's true, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, and I appreciated your comment, one more thing, I appreciated your comment very much on the two stories of Genesis, because that's also manipulated in a way by many, especially with they too. It's the same story, it's just right. to augment each other. And I said it was two different stories, and I guess my wrestling with it, or I came to, is because Hebrews use stories, they use, you know, things to yeah. teach. And I see it as it being saying this is about relationships, not about science or history. This is about mm-hmm. relationships. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of where I put those two stories. They're about relationships in two different ways. First of all, relationships. Right. Our relationship with God, God's relationship with us, mm-hmm. and our relationship to each other. Um, right, right. Those stories. Yeah. So, um, I appreciate can, can I, before we get to the questions here, I promise, um, can I tell you what I think about the Adam and Eve story? Please do. I have to charge you extra for it, though. Did they have to pay to get into this? No. Oh, anyway, all right. Um, see, I, I think Genesis 1 is the actual creation story where humanity is created on the sixth day. The Adam story, I think, is a, <clears throat> it's a preview of the entire biblical story as a whole. And I, 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 write, I wrote about this in... Um, a book that's not out there, uh, The Evolution of Adam. I wrote about this in that book. If you've, I don't know if you've read it or not, it doesn't matter. But um, th- did you buy it? That's all I really care about. <laughs> I don't care if you read my books, do what you want. Um, 
But, you see, think about this. Adam was created by God out of dust, right? Placed into a paradise and given a law to obey. Don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And what happens if you don't obey? On the day you eat of it, you shall die. Well, they eat of it. What happens to them? They're cast out of the garden to wander. Israel is formed by God and then put into a lush land, a paradise-like land, the land of Canaan. And they're given law to obey. And if you obey, you stay. If you disobey, what happens? You're exiled. This is a medieval Jewish, I didn't make this up, but when I heard this, this makes a lot of sense. The Adam story is where Israel's story really begins. The Adam and Eve story is like a table of contents for the story you're going to be reading there on out. And it's a story of a struggle with obedience to God and then eventually exile from the promised land. So just as Adam was exiled, Israel is exiled later. Now Israel winds up coming back, at least some of them do, right? But that's, to me, that may, it's not a story of creation where people come from. It's a, it's a metaphor, it's symbolic, it's theologically loaded, it's the creation of a people, right? Because the world was created back in chapter one. There, I just solved that for you. So anyway, yeah. <laughs> Probably more from the Old Testament, probably about a, th about a thousand years it's writing, yeah. And the New Testament, maybe let's add a couple hundred years to that, so yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's the very thing I want to try to get into a little bit today and tomorrow. Yeah, let, let's, because that's actually, you're putting your finger on something very important, just how they saw themselves maybe even engaging the past as they went forward, and what all of them are struggling with is how people living at a later time are engaging a story that was written at a much earlier time and what relevance does it have and how do they understand it so they wind up moving along differently because like you said they're living in different cultures different times right so and I, I think that's a very very important characteristic of the Bible to understand and to grab hold of because I think it's actually very encouraging to see biblical writers saying, yeah, maybe God's not really like that. Maybe God is like something else, right? I, I, to me, that's like one of the most enlightening things that has happened to me in studying the Bible, just seeing that and not making excuses. Well, every biblical writer should be on the same page. Well, they're living in two completely different circumstances and they're different personalities and they understand God frankly differently at times and that's part of the Bible that's that's how it is that's how it works so how how can we how can people of faith embrace that and let it be
right? So I guess like, I mean, uh, not like you, I would say there really aren't any places in the Bible where I look and I say, oh gosh, this, because I'm trying to understand what they're saying and why they're saying it. And sometimes I'm pleasantly surprised by even a book like Leviticus. And I say even because it is a little bit tedious, right? Who's read Leviticus? Liars. You're all liars. No, um, <laughs> I, I'm sure you have. Uh, but it can get like really old quickly. You know, Exodus too, right? You get to the second half, it's all about building a tabernacle. It's like, really? You know, acacia wood crossbars and things like that. Yeah, so, but the thing is that, again, the point is why did they spend so much time on this? Why did they spend so much time on these sacrifices? And the Christian response has tended to be, well, because they got God wrong and, you know, they're just into all this legalism stuff. It wasn't legalism. And, and Leviticus is not legalistic. It's about purity. It's about how to connect with God. Some of it I disagree with. Some of it I'm pleasantly surprised about, you know, and it's really, a, 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 there's, a, there's depth going on in that book too, right? But it's, it's, it's not my favorite. You know. uh, one of my professors in graduate school said, if you're ever going to be an editor for a commentary series and you're looking for authors to fill up the books, get Leviticus covered first because nobody wants to do that one. So anyway, yes, sir, yeah. That's a big one, yeah. Um, yeah, Augustine is responsible for the idea of original sin, that the act of procreation downloads the sins of the parents and every other parent before them onto the child. So you're born in a state of alienation and wrath, right? Um, I just tell my students, I dare you. I double, I triple dog dare you, as they say, all right, to find that anywhere in the Bible, explicitly. It does, Paul uses language that sounds like that, but Paul is after something, I think, very, very different than this idea, right? So, um, you know, again, the Adam and Eve story, right? So, well, Adam... Adam and Eve sinned, and that introduces original sin. Now, everyone born after Adam and Eve is sinful and in a state of alienation from God, and there's no hope for them until Jesus comes. Really? Well, first of all, Adam, what's the punishment to Adam? Well, there are two punishments Adam gets. Anybody know what they are? Right. The ground's not going to yield the fruit easily, which is a beautiful image, actually, in Genesis, because Adam is, in Hebrew, Adam, and the ground from which he was taken is Adama. Adam, Adama. It's a pun. He's alienated from the earth that he's taken from. He's in a state of alienation. And the second one is, and your days will be mortal. You won't live forever. You'll die physically, eventually. There's nothing in that story about, and everyone born after you, right, is going to be in this state of sinfulness. In fact, the entire Hebrew scriptures assumes that people are not in a hopeless state of sinfulness because the law is right. Deuteronomy chapter 30, the law is right here. It's right in front of you. It's not far across the sea that someone has to go fetch it. It's not far down underground that somebody has to dig it up. It's right here. You can do this. You just have to want to do it. The Cain and Abel story, right? Right after that, where Cain kills Abel, right? The first sin, really, after, after the Adam story. 
there's nothing there about, well, Cain, I guess you couldn't help because you were born in sin. But the Cain is told, listen, don't follow in your father's footsteps. You can do this, right? There was the encouragement, like, don't give in to the temptation. It's not like you can't, right? So it is unfortunate that um, so much of Christian theology has been influenced by early medieval thinking. You know, and Augustine was no idiot. He did a lot of things. But the problem is that Augustine didn't know Greek. He knew Latin. And this gets a little technical, but this, the whole thing is at the end of Romans 5.12, the very last few words of Romans 5.12, where his Latin translation was frankly wrong. And it seems like God is saying that we all die because Adam sinned. But Paul doesn't say that. We all die because we sin. Right? So he, Paul puts the blame actually on us, not on Adam. Right? But my point is that Augustine, his Bible read differently. And it's really unfortunate. And everybody talks about how his... Um, something that's become so influential in Christianity. Not all forms of Christianity. Greek Orthodox are not really big on original sin. They, they don't think that way. They think, they think people are sick, not hopelessly in wrath. The church is a hospital. That's, that's how they look at things. A little bit oversimplified. But, um, so yeah, and the thing is, you know, how do you deal with that is the fact that Christian theologians have been dealing with that for hundreds and hundreds of years. It's, it is actually a discussion in Christianity. You know? I think people aren't all bad. I think some people are bad, but I, I, when I, I don't look at people and I say, you're fundamentally a bad person. Right? Yes, right. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the thing is, Adam and Eve were to have, you know, don't eat, yeah, God doesn't want you to eat from the tree, because if you do, you'll just be like God, knowing good from evil. Well, the thing is that that is actually the point, I think, of the whole Hebrew scriptures, is for Israel to know the will of God. But the thing is, you can't grab it in your own time. It has to be taught and mentored in, 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 in paces. You know, I, I think that's more the point. So there's, really, there's a blessing there at the beginning and not, not a curse. Yeah, it's unfortunate, but yeah. So what was Jesus saving us? Good question. Next question. Anybody else? <laughs> no, the, see, the thing is, that's... Um, yeah, what was, if, if, okay, if Adam didn't screw everything up, what is Jesus saving us from, right? And I think I have plenty of things I need saving from that I can't blame Adam for, right? Um, in today's language, we would put it like being saved from our egos, um, being saved from the cycle of dysfunction that goes from one family to the next, um, being saved from perpetuating um, harmful ways of being a human being that we're responsible for, you know. Um, <clears throat> I don't, see the thing is, the thing about, this gets into a lot of stuff here, but I would turn that question around to somebody else who says, well, what, well what's Jesus saving us from? I was, I'm not asking you this, but I would say, well, what do you think Jesus is saving you from? And the answer usually comes out pretty quickly, hell. At, Jesus is here to keep you from going to hell. And again, I tell my students, find that for me someplace in the biblical story. I just don't see it, right? What is, God, what is Jesus saving us from? Um, the story of Zacchaeus, you know, he climbs the tree, right? And does he fall off or does he, I forget what it is, but, you know, he hears Jesus, he goes, what is, I'm going to give away half of everything that I own. And what does Jesus say to him? Salvation has come to this house. And I don't think Jesus is saying, wow, whew, good for you. If you die tonight, you'll go to heaven instead of going to hell. I think he's saying you're becoming transformed 
into more and more, let's say, the image of God. And Christians would say, and I think rightly so, that they're being transformed in the image of Christ in their dealings with other people, right? I think that's what, that's what salvation is. So, you know, I'm, I'm being saved all the time in different ways. And it's not about just punching the ticket, right? Now, if we had another hour and a half, we could talk about how Paul is talking about Jesus in Romans chapter 5, where he has Adam. Adam did the bad thing, and Jesus is the second Adam that fixes it, right? So Jesus saves us from sin and death. Well, Jesus gives life, right? I happen to believe that consciousness continues after death. But I don't know if Paul's talking about that because he has a Jewish way of thinking about things. So that's a big topic. But um, Paul says the first Adam disobeyed and brought condemnation. The second Adam obeyed and brought life and justification. Read any five commentaries on Romans chapter 5 and you'll see there's a lot going on there that people disagree about. It's a very, very difficult chapter. But I think pretty clearly when Paul says that Adam brought condemnation, that's not going to hell. The condemnation is the death sentence. That's what he's saying. By sin, death entered the world. That's the condemnation, that we die. Jesus is raised to life, which brings life to all people. So there's something about Jesus' saving that benefits humanity, I think, and not just a small subset of people who happen to live in parts of the world that have churches. I don't have a lot of friends talking like this, but that's okay. So, um, here and then there. So, yeah, go ahead. Oh, yes. I tried getting through that, but I got sidetracked. Yes, great book. Uh, Cast, the book Cast, which is about basically systemic racism, right? And it's how deep it is, too. Yeah, yeah. And in the book, she reminds, this is a story, of a Baptist that was going through a sleeping. He doesn't have a cover over his name. And he's got three sons. Four. Well, no, he's, I'm sorry, he has three sons. Yeah, good. He has three sons. Yeah, there's another four. Yeah, can we get a mic? Yeah. We're talking about the Noah. Start over with Noah. Yeah. Um, uh, Noah was sleeping after the flood, and um, his, one of his sons came in and saw him naked. He didn't have any clothes on. He didn't have a cover. And so for some reason, that is horrible. So he went out and told his brothers, our dad doesn't have any cover. So the other two sons go in and cover him up. But the thing of it is, this one son saw him naked. And when Noah finds out about this, he's very upset. And so he banishes the son off. And that's where we get um, the division of people with black skin, because that's right. where the story comes from. That's right. the creation of it. Right. And I've just never understood why such a crazy tale would have anything to do with the color of somebody's skin. It, it, is, it is crazy, but here's where the craziness, it always makes just enough sense to people run with it. So you have the three sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, right? They spread out eventually, and Ham, his people go where? Way to off. the African continent. Yeah. Part, that's part of where they go, like Egypt and places like that. Well, that's where black people are. Right, so that's, that's all you need if you're a racist reading the Bible in the 19th century, right? So, but the thing is, um, that's frankly a stupid reading of that story. I mean, th there, are, there are multiple ways of reading certain stories. That's, not, that's really dense, I think, because it's so overtly manipulative of it to get it to say something that you really want it to say, I think. But... It's actually interesting, too, because, you know, you got these three sons, and Shem 
his, his kids all go, Abraham comes from Shem. And Shem is where we get Semitic from, by the way. Right? That's the word Semitic comes from Shem. Japheth, they go up to Greece. Nobody cares about them. But Ham goes down there. And Ham has four sons. Um, Luz, Put, Mitzrayim, and Canaan. Mitzrayim means Egypt. Canaan means Canaan. Right? So here's the thing. Noah is drunk out of his mind. Right? He's in a stupor. He's lying naked. Who knows what's going on? Ham comes in and, as the story goes, sees his father's nakedness. Here's, there's a possible double meaning there. To see someone's nakedness or to uncover their nakedness means to have sex with them. <laughs> right? He doesn't actually say that, but he implies it, the writer. Right? So, he comes back out again. He had dad's naked in there. And they said, what did you do? So they come and they cover him up. Noah wakes up, right, from this drunken stupor, right? And what does he say? He doesn't say, boy, I have a headache. What was I thinking last night, right? He says, cursed be who? Who did this? Ham did this. He doesn't say, cursed be Ham. He says, cursed be Canaan, right? That makes no sense. Why that one? Why? Why? curse Canaan for something the father did? And why not curse all of his sons? Why curse that one son? Because this is political propaganda. Canaan is the land they're going to be taking over in, you know, X number of years. And all these stories are written in light of that reality. So what the Israelites are, I hope this, I mean, I hope some of you don't care, frankly. I hope it just doesn't like really bother you or upset you because I, I think this is really rather true that these stories are written later on during like the monarchy, right? And they're telling their story from the beginning and they're embedding into their story their privileged status, which they wind up finding in their own story they don't really have as privileged a status as they thought they did. That's part of the, their journey, their spiritual journey, is to be sort of put into their place a little bit, right? But cursed be Canaan, which justifies what? Going into the land, killing the Canaanites and taking their land, right? So, I think it's, I think that story is far more interesting and frankly a bit more disturbing then uh, Ham, they went down into Africa, so they have dark skin, so God doesn't like black people. Got it. Okay. That's, that's insane. You know, that's just, I don't get it. So. It, they'll find anything. You can find anything, you know, except the Ethiopian eunuch in the book of Acts is the first convert to Christianity. So, okay, whatever. We'll skip that part. Skip that part. We'll go with the other one. So, okay. Um, Helen, yes. Mike. As an old social worker and a therapist, <laughs> I hate to say this, but I wonder about the mental health of our concept of God. Mm. I mean, he seems, she seems to uh, demand uh, such worship and control over us, and judging, judging, mm -hmm. judging. Um, uh, it's very disturbing to me yeah. that this is um, how I've come to have this concept of God, right. and has really driven me away from the uh, deepest of Christianity, and I still consider myself a Christian. Yeah. Um, but this is very upsetting. Yeah. I mean, this man is, this person, this God, so egotistic, not yeah. good mental health. Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> and with that, we can all go home, I think, and <laughs> cry in our beer a little bit. Um, see, this, this is uh, the way I approach that, and I say I approach it, I'm not, this isn't like me making stuff up. It's just, I mean, I've circled these issues a lot and you know I don't have final answers but um, 
I don't think the way the Bible always describes God is what God is actually like. Right? So that's how I, that's how I deal with that. I, say, I don't think God's like this. Well, you're just picking and choosing from the Bible. You're darn right I am. Everybody does that including the racists who don't look at, you know, the Ethiopian eunuch. You know, we all, we all pick and choose, frankly. The question is, why do we pick and choose? Why do we foreground some things and background other things, right? And so, you know, I, I don't think the God of the infinite universe, who somehow pervades quantum particles and galaxies, is overly concerned about kill them and take their land. I think people think that way, and we tend to create God in our own image. What's the old joke? I forgot who said this. It was either Mark Twain or Rousseau. Depends on what website I look at. But um, in, in the beginning, God created man in his own image. And like gentlemen, we've been, ret we've been returning the favor ever since, right? Which is... Who said that? Anybody know? Or was it Rousseau? Somebody, I know, Bart Simpson, I don't know who said it. But, um, but you know, I, I think that's true. And I think what we're seeing in the Bible is uh, biblical writers struggling actually with their conceptions of God. Which isn't a very Protestant thing to say, typically. You know, it, it's more of a progressive Protestant thing to say. By the way, I don't like the word progressive. I don't hate it, but it's, I, I, I prefer words like I'm adjusting my view of God based on the experiences that I have. That's a <laughs> I know. But, or I'm adapting things, you know. I mean, progressive can sound like, um, and, and the people I know don't mean it like this, but it sounds to people like you're condescending. I sort of am, but, you know, um, you know what I mean? But it, it sounds condescending. I'm not condescending. But, you know, Brian McLaren talks about this, too. He says, um, I, I think he uses terms like um, conservationist and innovationist. He uses those words which he thinks are a little less electric. I heard him, I, I don't know what book he says it's in, but I heard him speak about this once. And um, he, he says that... Um, the two need each other because the innovators are still trying to bring something along and not leave it behind. And the more conservationally minded people, if you poke them a little, they know they're not living in first century Palestine. Right? They know that we have different issues in front of us. They know that we have science or you know whatever. And in a way, they can find a way to sort of live together a little bit, you know. I will say, just a little commercial here, Eastern University, where I teach, we have a very diverse faculty and student body. I don't know how we keep it together, but we have faculty that are openly advocating for same-sex marriage, and others who I'm pretty sure think the world's 6,000 years old. They don't teach theology, they don't teach science, but they teach business or some other useless major, not, <laughs> not Bible. But uh, anyway, you know, um, so I, I think it's possible to have a, um, a sense of Christian community that's not based on we all agree exactly on all the same stuff, but it's rooted in something. Again, if I can pick on Judaism a little bit, you know, I've, you know, Jews vehemently disagree with each other and they go to the same synagogue and they don't care. <laughs> you know why? Because the discussion is what it is, right? It's not about, remember that quote, it's, for Christians, it's a message to be proclaimed. It's all about getting the right message. That's the legacy of the Protestant Reformation. There have been good things from it, but also maybe not some good things. There's one meaning to Scripture, right? And this is the way it is, and you fight about you leave Rome, you start your own little factions, all of a sudden you've got like 50 different ways of doing it, right? This is my body. What do you mean by is? Right? Is it actually literally Jesus' body or is it a memorial? Is it a reminder? 
Is Jesus spiritually there? What does the is mean? It's like Clinton, right? It depends on what your definition of is is, right? You remember him, right, Bill Clinton? Um, so, you know, I, I, I think, you know, it's, it's the, the Protestant attempt to sort of bring things together in response to some Catholic abuses. I think we can say that too. Like medieval Catholicism in the higher up levels was not great, you know. If you give us money, your relatives will get out of purgatory quicker. Like TV preachers say pretty much the same thing today, right? It's no different, right? So there were excesses, there was weird stuff happening. But the thing is that if the focus is on getting the Bible right, immediately there's splinter, right? So I really long for Christian communities where you can have real disagreements about things, but you're somehow united with something different, right? But that doesn't always happen. You know, which is a shame, but whatever. Um, yes, go ahead. What do you want? It doesn't matter. <laughs> Mike, we need the mic. No, that's okay. There are people in the back. You're loud this way, but not always to the back, right? So, yeah. Um, I struggle with how much the Holy Spirit has in the writing of the Bible. And if the Holy Spirit was involved with the writing of the New Testament, was the Holy Spirit involved with the writing of the Old Testament? Or is the Holy Spirit just involved with the editing of the books? What are your thoughts? Um, the question of revelation and inspiration, those are um, perennially difficult topics to talk about because they're, I, I keep saying this, I'm not trying to get out of it, that's an immensely complicated question that theologians talk about. The, everything depends on what we mean by God-inspired writers. Whatever it means, when I read the Bible, I see contradictions. So clearly it was about getting the information right, right? So sometimes people come with this idea of like, well, inspiration means God almost dictates things, which that's sort of a view of fundamentalism. Evangelicals don't really believe that, but fundamentalism pretty much, but not always, but pretty much does. Or, you know, God inspires them, or God gives them the gist, and they put it in their own words, and those words are also sort of guided by God in some mysterious way. In other words, they come at it from a top-down level. I come at it from a bottom-up level, meaning, what am I reading, right? I'm reading things that are not clear, right, are difficult to understand, that are at odds with each other, but have strands of continuity. I, I'm reading an anthology of literature that's compiled over a thousand plus years of time. And I want to say, what role does God have with that? And my answer is, yeah, let me think about that. <laughs> I don't want to come at it and say, well, if God inspired the Bible, as soon as somebody says that, they already have a notion in their head about what inspiration means. I want to let the Bible challenge the notions of inspiration that we have. What does it mean for God to reveal God's self? I don't know, but the portraits of God that I see in Deuteronomy versus some Psalms is a very different portrait of God. There's, um, again, I'm really not trying to sell books here. Just, I'm, I'm not kidding here, but I don't, you know. Um, the yellow one out there, what's it called again? Um, the Bible tells me so, right? I use a phrase in that book that uh, one of my seminary professors used, and he said, God lets his children tell the story. They tell the story as real human beings in a culture where there are views of God that make sense. By the way, we do that too. We don't have some higher view of God. We're very much influenced by the world around us and how we think about God. And, oh no, which one of us is right? 
what if God's bigger than us? How's that for a radical thought, right? I mean, what if, what if God is um, pleased with our honest attempts to try to understand divine reality? And more than that, more than understand, actually try to live in a way that, well, is the stuff Jesus taught all the time, dying to yourself. You know, again, we would call that ego today. What if, what if those are the things that are important? What if that is where the inspiration happens? You know what I mean? It's, 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 it's maybe not, I don't want to say it's not in the words themselves. I don't know that. I mean, but I'm very just open to this. But it, maybe it's not simply thinking in terms of the writing of the books that are inspired. Oh, now you've gotten it right. Great. They each have a right, and they don't get along with each other, right? What good is that for an inspired text? Maybe it's in the way those texts have been used for good for over 2,000 years, and also for not so good. Ham, right? And all that stuff. So, yeah, I, I mean, it's, in other words, I think studying the Bible challenges our theology. It challenges how we view things like, what is the Bible? How does it work? Right? Nothing has challenged me more in my life of faith than simply reading the Bible and following questions where they go and realizing people have been thinking about this stuff for a long time. I'm not the first. Oh, look what I noticed. <laughs> you know, it's like, no, welcome. Welcome to a conversation that's been going on for a very, very long time. That's why, coming back to what I said before, I love the Bible. I love reading it. I love trying to understand it. There are times when I'm bored out of my mind. I don't really know why we need a first and second kings. Everything, every chapter is the same. I got it. The kings are horrible. I got it. It's kind of, the exile is coming. Fine. Can we just wrap it up here really quickly? But other people don't feel that way about first and second kings. I love Ecclesiastes. I love lament psalms, right? I love Genesis. I love Exodus, even the tabernacle stuff. Other people don't, right? Um, and I, I, you know, I think the Bible can be um, sort of like the Eucharist. It can be a means of grace for people. Sometimes not, sometimes yes. You all know Barbara Brown Taylor? You better know Barbara. She has this wonderful book, Learning to Walk in the Dark. And she has this concept she calls lunar spirituality. Our life of faith is like the phases of the moon. Sometimes it's dark. Sometimes there's a sliver of light. Sometimes it's a full moon, right? It's a beautiful image. I feel that way about the Bible, too. Sometimes it's like, man, I love reading Colossians, you know. But 2 Corinthians, I read it last summer again. And it's like, Paul, I don't want my friends to meet you. It's like, you're just so... You know, you're so um, defensive about stuff, you know. You know, uh, before I go, Helen, uh, just the whole God thing, you know, about um, God being rather vindictive, I guess, is a way of putting it, maybe. You know, that's, that's a big issue. And um, I think there are places in the Hebrew Bible that already challenge that. And I think the New Testament challenges it pretty thoroughly. You know, again, New Testament b written by Jews. Let's not forget that, right? Not by Methodists <laughs> or Episcopalians, right? But written by Jews who are processing, in light of Jesus, what is God like, right? In light of Jesus, what is God like? In light of X, what is God like? That's a way of reading the whole Bible. Because you have biblical writers saying, in light of this situation, how are we going to talk about God? And Leviticus has its way. You know, Deuteronomy has its way. Isaiah, the first 39 chapters, has its way. You get to chapter 40 and following, it's a different way. You know, it's, and it's not like they're confused. It's just that's the way it is, right? How many of you think about God today the same way that you thought about God 30 years ago? Or four. I hope you don't, right? I don't, you know, and it's not been easy. <laughs> it's not been easy having my views of God change. I've had to eat some humble pie and realize that I don't know what I'm talking about, you know, and that's when the fun starts, right? That's, I mean, I, I mean that in a reverent way. That's when 
um, God is not just an object, a task to be mastered, so to speak, but God is always out ahead of us. And I actually see that modeled in the Bible itself, you know. I mean, one thing I'd like to do tomorrow a little bit, we're getting close to the end here, but I'd like to poke at maybe a couple of Old Testament stories, a couple of New Testament stories, not in great detail, that actually, I think, illustrate how they're always discovering something about God that the older tradition couldn't account for. And it gets really, really interesting. We'll see how things go. If, if we don't have time today, we'll just we'll pick that up tomorrow. But with, are there other hands? Yeah. Well, hurry up, Rusty. What are, you, what are you walking for? The man wants to ask a question. Let's go. I have the New York humor. Please just throw me out of your state if you want to. That's fine. He said you uh, enjoyed when people interpret, interpret the Bible differently. Uh, and I think that's where we are today. It's causing a lot of problems. We have the conservatives. In fact, we have a schism in this church right now going on where the conservatives want to do it one way, the progressives the other way. Right. Don't like. Uh, uh, where do we go from here? I like to use the Bible to solve problems, and I don't know where to go from here. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I, don't, I mean, I don't know where to go either because this stuff is, you know, there's a lot of fear. There's a lot of identity. There is a lot of mixture of politics and religion. You know, I mean, that's something that we're not supposed to do, but, you know, people have said evangelicalism is the state religion pretty much at this point, and I think that's true. Not... There's good evangelicalism and bad evangelicalism. This is the bad stuff. There's good stuff. I mean, I'm not evangelical, but some of my best friends and relatives are evangelicals. And I mean that. We get along fine. They know me. We don't hate each other, right? But what to do, I don't know. Um, see, I know a lot of conservatives who don't like what's happening in the American political and religious scene. I think the people that we're looking at as conservatives are actually not theologically conservative. I think they're white Christian nationalists, and that's not the same thing, right? And that's, that's the trouble, and they don't know it. And, and the whole God and country thing has been so enmeshed, they don't know how to take it apart. And I say, just read Paul and the book of Revelation, and it'll be taken apart from you pretty quickly. But that's, that's an intellectual response that doesn't address the fears of losing their country and what we fought for in World War II. And, and um, yeah, I'm a Yankee fan. Is that okay to say in Utah? You don't have a baseball team, so you don't care. Um, <clears throat> um, but ever since 9-11, in the seventh inning stretch, you know, there's the flag and God bless America is sung. And I understand that, but, you know, militarism and God, that's just, that's really wrong, I think. You know, that's, I mean, now the thing is that here's the, here's the tricky part. Can you justify that? Oh yeah, you can justify from parts of the Old Testament. Right? God's the warrior, God's the general of the army, and you go kill the Canaanites. You go into the land and you take it. Right? And right now what we have in America is we have a nation that used to be God's nation and the Canaanites are taken over again. We've got to get rid of them. Right? See, this is why it's really important to have a thoughtful understanding of what is the Bible anyway? What is it there to do? What is its purpose? And I don't think its purpose is to read American politics into a tribal situation. But try telling that to people for whom the Bible is God's direct communication to you to tell you what to do. Right? That's why I write the books that I write, frankly. To demystify the Bible without letting go of it. Right? I think that's very important to, to put the Bible in its place, so to speak by pointing out 
not only the fact of diversity, diverse voices in the Bible, to the point even of flat-out contradictions, but to see what's valuable spiritually about a Bible that actually acts like that. But again, that won't, that's, not, that's not something you take to a fundamentalist conference and talk about. They won't listen. But you have to put it out there because eventually they're going to get tired of that and they're going to, where can I land? And if the only spaces we have are crazy spaces, they're, they're not going to land any place. You know? Anyway. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring us to a close. Uh, Pete obviously came from Philadelphia, so it's fairly late for him. But we will start tomorrow at 10 o'clock and come at whatever time you want to. Uh, he might be around. Uh, and and, and you, can, you can talk with him or chat with him. If you'd like a book, you, you're certainly welcome to get that tonight. And uh, again, we want to thank you so much for being here and being a part of this. Uh, we just can't thank you enough. So. Sure. Had a good time. Thank you, folks. And, and I hope to see half of you tomorrow. That's good. So that's good. God, we give thanks for this night. Different people coming from different places, thinking different things. And yet we are here to learn more, to expand our understanding of what it is we're about. So God, thank you for gathering us and bless us on the way out. In Christ's name we pray, amen.